Okay. I'm stressed out now. That oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so today is Friday, December 7th at mm -hmm. 9.15 in the morning. Um, we're here with Dr. Michael Wong, interviewing him for the Houston Asian American Archive. My name is Priscilla Lee. Uh, my name is Chin Chin Yi. Okay. So Dr. Wong, we'll start out with um, asking you where and when you were born. Mm -hmm. I was born in Canada. Uh, it's a country up north. Uh, I joke a little bit, so. <laughs> and I assume you'll edit as well. Um, I was born in Canada, uh, in the province of Quebec, in the city of Quebec City. Okay. Uh, and that is in the French part of, the French-speaking part of Canada, mm -hmm. uh, and not on the west side of Canada. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, did you grow up speaking French? I learned French. Uh, I grew up uh, learning Cantonese at home. Mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of time at home, a lot of snow, so we stayed indoors. And uh, when I went to school for one year um, in Canada, I was in kindergarten, and that's when they taught me a lot more French. I learned a little bit of French from TV, but mm -hmm. in, in, in school they taught me French. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And what was your childhood like? What was my childhood like? It was awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, I could go in so many ways with this. Yeah, you can just pick out like a couple stories and maybe, I don't know, maybe um, pick some stories that like led you to where you are today. Maybe. Yeah, well, it's, up to you. it's um, what I will say is that uh, being born in Canada, um, I'm a U.S. citizen now, um, but back then, I, I mean, it was, it was, um, it was cold. Uh, Canada was very cold. Uh, Quebec City was very cold, and I wasn't there for that long. Six years old uh, when we moved, with my full family, with my siblings, and so, and so I was very young, and you know, we just played and and uh, in our neighborhood. It was very quiet, and it was just very nice. But when it got cold, it got really cold. That's one of the things I remember. Um, I also remember there were not very many Asians uh, uh, up in Canada where we lived. My dad owned a Chinese restaurant up there, so one of the few. And uh, it was pretty much either my siblings and I were at home or at the restaurant. It's one of those places, um, especially during the winter. And so it was good. I mean, I, I, I was... I was uh, it was fun, I guess, and um, but we really didn't know what to make of it other than lots of snow, and snow was great, but it was very cold, and uh, and then at some point, uh, uh, my parents said, uh, my mom said, oh, you know what, it's a little too cold. Let's go ahead and go on moving down south. So we moved uh, to the U.S. Uh, when I was six years old. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, how many siblings do you have? I have a, a total of three siblings, so I'm the eldest of four. Um, I'm the eldest of four, and then two years below me, two years younger, younger than me, is my sister. Uh, and then two years younger than her is my brother. And then five years younger than him is my other brother. So I have two brothers and a sister. Okay. Yeah. So where were your parents from? My parents were from... the. My mother's from Hong Kong, and my father's from uh, Guangdong uh, uh, province. Um, I don't know the name of his the small town that he lived in. Uh, but that region is Guangdong. Yeah, right next to Hong Kong. Okay. Um, and then, why did your parents move to Canada and the, like immigrate to Canada? Uh, that's a, uh, it's a, everything's a long story. Uh, you know, uh, every every story is a, and it could be long or short. But I like to, for you guys, I'll make it long. Right. Um, my dad and mom. There's all sorts of stories there. So uh, before my mom and dad married, my dad was in Canada already working. Mm -hmm. It's the old generation. It's the old school of doing things. Uh, and so his dad had many children, and my dad was the eldest of like seven. Just a lot. And uh, so my grandpa, his dad, sent my dad over to Canada. Make money, send it back home, send it back to the motherland. Yeah, and so that was what he did for many years, actually. Um, he did that in, in the Vancouver area and then uh, uh, working for his uncle, actually. So I guess my granduncle. Um, and then after a certain point, my dad wanted well, to have a family. So he moved, went back to uh, China, Hong Kong, and met my mom, married. And then they moved back to Canada, but instead of Vancouver to... Uh, 
to Quebec City. Okay. Yeah. Um, and did your parents also stay in the restaurant business when they came to the U.S.? They did. So my father owned a Chinese restaurant. Another story there, but I'll shrink it for you guys. Uh, owned the Chinese restaurant up in Canada, uh, and uh, it was a great business decision. Why? Because there were very few Chinese restaurants. So his restaurant was just popping. I mean, it was so busy, and he was a, uh, he was he, he was okay leaving, you know, uh, Canada to move to California uh, for the sake of the family. But he, his business was going, was going really well. Uh, then when he when we all moved to Sacramento, California, um, and we had relatives there, uh, my dad had to start over, and so he decided uh, there's a lot of Chinese restaurants uh, in uh, in Sacramento. So let's um, let's think of something else and so he decided to um, well work at a couple of restaurants first and then after a couple of years of figuring out what the, uh, the, the the landscape was for the business he decided he will not open a Chinese restaurant but a barbecue restaurant yeah Texas style barbecue oh, restaurant Texas. yeah with I did not know at the time but that was Texas style food okay, interesting. Yeah. so how did you choose Texas style it was, um, he was, so my dad's a very friendly person, so he talks to customers and things like that, but he was looking to strike out on his own, and, so, and then he, connections and networking, and eventually he, did, he learned that there was one restaurant that was um, selling and, you know, making uh, barbecue-style foods, and the owners were about to sell. He said he wants them. Yeah, so that's how he... I uh, got to know the the, uh, the restaurant owners, and eventually he bought the restaurant from the owners, and then they retired, and then my dad owned it for 30 plus years. Oh. Yeah. Okay. What kinds of principles did your parents raise you on? Um, what kind of principles? You know, we never talked about principles uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, we do the Chinese, uh, you know, um, observance of the, of the festivals and, and, and holidays. Uh, um, but there was never sort of a, any religious sort of undertones or, or a discussion about that. We just sort of did it. Yeah. Okay. And so nothing ever was explicit like, oh, these are the, you know, the, the principles that you're supposed to abide by. We, don't, we didn't talk. We just did it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but then thinking back, I guess uh, the things that we learned up when we're, uh, I, don't know. I actually, I, I'm, 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 I, I'm not sure what the right term is. Uh, maybe it's, I don't want to say Confucian or, 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 or Taoist or Taoist, uh, but I think that there's aspects of all those things that, that came out in our upbringing, I would say. Uh, but certainly uh, the things that uh, my mom and dad taught us was you know, hard work, you know, good education, and uh, respect your elders and family. Family comes first. And so that, that was one of, the, of course, the reasons why we moved from Canada to, to uh, California. My mom had already, her siblings, my aunt and uncle were already living in that area. So they were able to sponsor us and that was already kind of a home, you know, kind of a a built-in family there for us and we moved in in that area, so. Um, What kinds of foods did you grow up eating? What kind of foods? Everything. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Of course, Cantonese food, that's my home base. Uh, uh, I still love it. Um, American food, uh, very you know, very standard stuff. Uh, I'll tell you the foods that we I did not uh, learn how to eat or enjoy when living in Sacramento. It's only until I went to college, really. Went to college and then, but before then, I didn't know Japanese food. I heard of it, but you know, raw fish. Come on, now, right? Uh, Vietnamese food that that was not a thing back in Sacramento at that time. And so, um, but growing up, Cantonese food, grandmother cooking, mother cooking, and. Uh, and the big, you know, all the big family get-togethers. That that was that was um, that's very yummy. Okay. <laughs> um, did your parents um, want to assimilate, or were they kind of resistant to it? They wanted us to assimilate big time, big time. Um, and that's something they don't say. They didn't say. They didn't yeah. say. Oh, okay, Mike, assimilate. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just the way of doing things and thinking back. Yes, you know, we. Um, and I would say for the three of us, before my younger brother was born, he was born American, my youngest one. So he was already kind of, he's already a little different from the three of us. But the three of us, myself, my sister, and my, my younger brother, um, when we moved down, we were, you know, we were immigrants. 
um, not immigrants from, say, you know, China or Hong Kong, but immigrants from Canada. So it, we're already kind of, you know, what are we, right? Um, and But one of the things that my mom and dad wanted us to do was to get up to speed as quickly as possible. And, you know, for, for all the good reasons, right? You know, so that it's, uh, you learn easier and, and to assimilate the culture. And um, so they absolutely wanted us to assimilate. In fact, that was... Um, because of that, uh, my parents said, you know, you don't need to learn Chinese. Well, you already learn. You, you already know it at home, which was kind of true. You know, we know it speaking-wise, but writing-wise, I didn't know it until I had to take it like much later in my life. So, um, so yeah, short answer is yes. You have a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> Can you describe like your schooling, like elementary, middle, and high school? Sure. Um, I would say public school. Mm -hmm. That was uh, how we grew up learning and going through the U.S. Uh, educational system. Um, elementary school, middle school, high school, all public schools, and we were lucky. We lived in you know middle middle class neighborhoods. I mean, we weren't rich or anything like that, but we worked hard and, and we lived in an area that was. Had some good schools. We lucked out. I mean, uh, the schools nowadays—it's it's a little different now. Um, and we worked hard. And you know, I, for me, I like—I like school. I like learning. Okay. Um, yeah, I was geeky in school. Uh, and uh, but I enjoyed it. And and one of the things that uh, um, and I had some great teachers too. Uh, really loved my teachers. Uh, they. They were absolutely influential. I mean, as influential as my parents uh, were the teachers in high school. Elementary school teachers, I remember their names kind of, sort of, you know, middle school. I, I know the school, but I don't, I don't think about them. If I think about any teacher from my childhood, they're my high school teachers. Uh, and that's why I'm a teacher today. Were they your science teachers or like? Yeah, okay. yeah. One of my uh, my favorite teachers. Um, I would say I had three favorite. I had many favorite teachers. Yeah, I was a teacher's pet. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, but I liked it, you know. And um, and they, my math teacher, loved her. Um, and she, I didn't realize she was helping me out on all sorts of things. But she thought I could do well in college, and so she, you know pushed me to go to college, and so I did. Um, wrote a nice letter. Uh, my science teacher, biology teacher. I don't do too much biology, um, but my biology teacher was very influential. Um, and and uh, my math teacher passed away many years ago, and I still think about her. You know, uh, my biology teacher. He's retired, but we emailed uh, about six months ago. And I got this email out of the blue. Oh my goodness warm fuzzy feelings wrote an email back and uh, so at some point I'll try to visit him and uh, and my other teacher that I still remember I remember all my but the uh, third one I would say is uh, my English teacher yeah. my English teacher of all people I still remember her Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Corzine uh, Mrs. Steinberg with my math teacher my uh, biology teacher is uh, Mr. D'Augusta my uh, English teacher is um, well Mrs. Waugh mm -hmm. and uh, why, why, why do I still remember her and she knew I was going to be going to college, or rather, she said, "Oh, you're going to do great in college." And uh, but she knew I was going to be on the STEM side of things. I said, you know, Mike, you know, whatever you do in uh, in, in in science and engineering, you're going to do a good job. But you still got to learn English. You still got to learn how to write and read, and um, because you don't want to be called an engineer by other people. <laughs> so so I took that to heart, and so and so go, flashing forward to where I am today. Uh, a lot of these lessons come out when I talk to my students in my uh, junior level class and, and my own graduate students is that you can do all the technical stuff as best as you can and better than anyone else, but if you can't communicate written-wise or, 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 or word-wise, um, um, then, then you pull yourself back. Then, then, then you are not as good as you can be. And so, Anyways, that, that's going back to your question. Yes, my high school... Uh, teachers had some very, very um, influential ones. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are there any other things that you're now like passing on from your teachers to your students? Yeah, all the time. Um, I don't think about it as in, you know, what did I remember from Mrs. Steinberg's class or from yeah. even my college teachers uh, or professors? Um, it's just sort of 
things that I it makes sense to me I it becomes part of me um, and when and when it comes out it just sort of comes out kind of as a as part of my advice um, whether it's on writing and just something I just said earlier it's uh, uh, if you can't communicate you might as well not have done the research okay um, if you can't think logically if you can't write logically then that means you might not be thinking about this stuff logically. So by writing logically, it forces you to think logically. Um, so think little things like that, um, I think comes from my own experiences, uh, learning what I'm doing now, but also definitely from my teachers. And so, um, yeah. good handwriting skills. You've got to have good handwriting. And so that's something I remember from my English teacher. <laughs> um, when did you start feeling like I'm in America? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's 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 a tough question. Um, I don't have a good answer because I hadn't thought about that. Um, I mean, what did you feel like an American? I mean, uh, yeah, I guess I never thought about it either. <laughs> but like, I mean, just like um, coming from Canada, what did you feel like? Oh, I can become like assimilate into the society. Yeah. Let me ask you guys, did you get, were you born here or did you come? Okay. Um, so, you guys are ABCs. Okay. Um, I'm an ABC. Um, but I correct people, I say I'm a CBC. Um, and, and especially for those who, you know, who are not, you know, Asians or Asian Americans, they, they, they don't get it. So, you know, I, I love to talk about it and I explain a little bit. And, um, when I first thought about what it means to be American, I would say, like to know what that word means, not that I felt it, but that there was a big transition. It wasn't when I first crossed the border. Okay, that was when I was six years old. I could barely see above the window, okay? I was just driving across one week, cross country. Um, I would say, I didn't feel I was Canadian anyway. I just felt I, there was no differentiation, and, and and I think the schools that I went to was uh, diverse enough where it wasn't a deal. It wasn't a big deal at all. Um, I, I just I looked more Chinese than I looked Canadian. Let's put it this way, and there were a lot of Asians and Chinese um, in the school that I was and in, in, in the neighborhood. So that was sort of my baseline, actually. Um, when I first felt I was an American, I would say definitely when I became naturalized. So my mother applied for citizenship, uh, and in, at that time when she went through the citizenship test and, and eventually got it, uh, at that time the rules, uh, the U.S. rules were if you have kids 16 years old or below, those children have an option of keeping their Canadian citizenship or their uh, uh, citizen of their birth country or to switch and to drop and then to take and then because at that time you could only have you can't have dual citizenship and so we all said we're going to become Americans and so that felt good that felt interesting that felt uh, very different um, what did it mean I don't know uh, I just remembered I had to say call you know uh, cite the pledge we know the pl we knew we were we were in America by that time and we knew the history and and uh, but having that little piece of paper that says you're an American citizen now that that felt special. Mm -hmm. That felt special. Um, and so that's one answer. Okay, yeah. And then probably as I then graduated from high school and into college, I mean that, that's a whole different world. Mm -hmm. And literally when I moved from Northern California to Southern California, that where what I grew up around with were all these Asians and Chinese who in the community, they were not there at my undergraduate school or in the city. I went to Caltech uh, in Pasadena, California. That was where the city that I lived in for four years. There, th it was such a different makeup. And so I felt different. If, and so there was that adjustment period. And so that's when I became more self-conscious, wasn't, isn't the word, but more aware of how different I was. Um, and so I don't think you ever become a true American. You sort of evolve, I would say, uh, but certainly when I became a citizen, that was, oh, okay, I guess I am American now. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you like, decide to move to Caltech? 
I wanted to go to a college that was not close to Sacramento. <laughs> Simply put, um, no, I, I applied to colleges and I, you know, did pretty well in in, uh, in, in, in high school and and I could have gone to the local universities or I could have gone uh, to private or public schools, but at that time, I my my worldview was very limited uh, because Sacramento was very good to my family and to me. Uh, I was happy there, um, but I didn't know what else was outside of Sacramento. And to think about going outside, you know, across state boundaries, well, I mean, that that's that's that was that was something I considered, but at the end, I I didn't think I was mature enough to to do that yet. And so, yeah, I could have gone to MIT, but I, I, it was too far away. And so, uh, the decision I made at that time, and there was no internet, by the way, okay, uh, it's not that long ago. Uh, if one thinks about the the timing and dates of all these things, no cell phones, no computers. It was all. You want to get information from this school, you've got to write a little letter. And then you get the brochure in the mail later on. So things are very slow. Um, and the communications, and you can't email the admissions uh, office to talk to someone. Or, oh, who in Sacramento went to MIT or went to Caltech? Let me go talk to them. No, there was no, it was, it was not as it is now. So eventually I applied to a whole bunch of schools. I made it to you know several sort of my top choices. Uh, but at the end, you know, MIT was too far away, you know, Berkeley was a little too close, and I said, well, you know, uh, I do feel, I, I do like my, my, my STEM stuff, so, oh, uh, I did apply to Caltech, and it's, it should be like MIT, but just in California, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and go there. I went there sight unseen. I didn't visit. I just looked good on the, cal in the, the catalog. And people said it was good. My math teacher said it was excellent. So I mean, that was that was a, that was a big deal. My science teacher as well I said okay. I said yes. And then in the fall, my parents, the uh, family, family drove down, dropped me off, and drove back off. And that was my first time on campus. Man, <laughs> uh, that's a uh, that's that always that was a life changing experience. So, but the answer is. Yeah, um, process of elimination. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Catholic culture is like very unique, right? You're like, yeah. You test to be in a dorm. It's house. it's almost like it, it's a uh, Rice and Caltech are a lot in many ways are uh, alike in many ways. Um, in fact, actually, there, there's a the college system here. It's the same as Caltech. Caltech we call it a um, house system. Mm -hmm. um, Smaller than Rice, so instead of a thousand per class, I think it's about maybe two hundred twenty-five total. Um, and uh, the matching process is uh, is well here it's a random right, and so at Caltech uh, it's random for the first week. You're sort of randomly assigned to to the houses, and and then you interview uh, the different houses, and then after a week or two the, after the matching process, then. And then you get chosen into your into your house, and so um, there's a lot of similarities and differences, but definitely that small uh, smallness and close knitness of the community that that uh, that was Caltech. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so how was your experience there throughout the four years, like academically, so socially? Yeah, I was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah, I was awesome. Awesome. <laughs> um, it was tough, really tough, um, and just like here, you know, the, the, you have. You, you guys are very good. You guys got in here, but you realize there's a whole lot of good people here too. So you have to recalibrate a little bit, and uh, and some people were, um, you know, just like you. It's a, you adjust quickly to it. Like you know, you don't have to be the best in everything, uh, but you have to appreciate that you know you can't be the best in everything, but you appreciate what people are really good at and learn from them. You don't want to be surrounded by a whole bunch of engineers. You don't want to be surrounded by a whole bunch of. Uh, of humanness, you want to be surrounded by by a really good mix of people because it really gets the juices flowing, you know, both your left hand side and the right hand side of your brain. Caltech, it was kind of like that, but very techy though, because it's Caltech, you know, Institute of Technology. Um, they still teach everything, I would say, um, but definitely the focus is on math and science and the STEM side. So I happen to li have liked it going in, and I happen to have liked it leaving. Caltech was really tough on certain people. Um, there a lot, of, a lot of classmates of mine that were very, very smart, smarter than I am. But you know, people burn out. People 
you know, have, thinking too much on this side but not the other side. And so, and they miss that. And so some people transfer after a couple of years. Some decide, well, I'm going to get my degree and I'm going to leave STEM completely. So for me, I, I was lucky. I was surrounded uh, by smart people um, and, and, and people who, who helped me grow, I would say. Um, and so I enjoyed my time at Caltech. Okay. So how did, what, is, what did you major in? I majored uh, in the major that I'm teaching now, chemical so engineering. engineering. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. So how did you decide to major in chemical engineering? I decided to major in chemical engineering when I couldn't decide if I liked math more or chemistry more. And that's one of those lessons that I've, that I've taken away, that I teach now to prospective students and to remind my students, why are you a chemical engineer? Uh, you don't have to choose between one or the other. If you like both equally, chemical engineering does both in equal amounts. So that's how I decided to try out chemical engineering. It was only until I got into it, taking the core courses, um, that's when I decided, oh, this is an interesting subject. Um, but I thought about computer science, I thought about electrical engineering, um, thought about physics maybe, but that, that lasted for a day. <laughs> uh, you know, but then I realized there's just a lot of smart people, and, um, but that's when I started to learn, well, and just at the college level, this, it's when you try to find your passion. You know, the passion is to major in three different areas, that's fantastic, that's really fantastic. I found my passion, I would say, not so much in chemical engineering, I, uh, that, that's, that's too strong of a word, I would say I liked it a lot. Okay? But I liked it enough to, to keep going, um, but I didn't know what I was going to do with my degree. But I kind of went along with it because I liked learning. And so that was, uh, and the other classes, boy, yeah, it was a side story. To be a CS major, although if I went down that route, I would have I, I I been rich many times over. A lot of those folks at that time, that was before the internet blew up. So if you were a CS major at that time, you'd be, you know, one of the big cheese in Microsoft or Intel at this point. So good for them, you know. Um, but for me, it was something that I decided, I'm just going to go take it semester by semester. And uh, eventually, I got to liking it okay, uh, in, in college. So. Um, so then how did you decide to go to grad school? Uh, I thought about grad school when you're a senior or in this junior year and you have to take these tests, you have to prepare a year in advance. And so I didn't know what I wanted to do with my degree. Um, and so, well, what did the graduating seniors in chemical engineering do or did at, uh, at Caltech? Remember, there was no internet. I can just, you know, email someone uh, uh, at some other schools, and, and so communication is very much restricted to those, uh, easy, easy communication to those that were, you know, in that community. And so, we, a lot went to grad school. So I thought, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll look into grad school. A few went to go get jobs. Uh, there was some, quite a bit of uh, opportunities for jobs in chemical engineering in, in the Southern California region. Um, so I applied, I took the GREs and then applied to places and, uh, and, but I think for me, I didn't feel I was ready to go get a job. It was just something that didn't excite me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that passion for it. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, let's just go with the flow. I mean, if people are thinking graduate school is what they've been going to, in, in doing, well, maybe I'll explore that a little bit more. Jobs, I'll do it, but you know, I'll just talked to a few companies, but I did, it, it wasn't something that excited me. And so, so that, just by process of elimination, I mm -hmm. said, all right, well, this is a less important to me, let's focus my energies on grad school. Okay. Yeah. So did your parents go to college? They did not. They did not. Um, they, when they dropped me off at Caltech, they said, see ya. Um, that was a big deal for them. Um, it cost them a lot of money, first of all. Um, and yeah, there's financial aid and whatnot, but for first generation, I mean, it, it's a lot of money. And for them, they it was a family decision also because it, they had to spend and you know, borrow money, etc. And but education, right? That's part of the Chinese culture. Education, go get that degree. And so they supported that big time. What my major was, they didn't know. They just assume if I get a degree, I'm going to make lots of money, right? Um, so that was, uh, and that was because my dad wasn't educated, but they appreciate, they knew the, 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 
the importance of education. My dad, uh, to your question, Jason, is that he his highest degree, sixth grade. Yeah, um, he could have been great actually, my dad. Um, but that's the circumstances. And my mom, she graduated from high school in Hong Kong, got married, started a family. Yeah. When we all moved to California, that's when she um, got, uh, she went to college to get an associate degree. And so, uh, and that, that's the extent of, of, of the education of my parents. So it's a little different, isn't it? So I was the first one basically in my family to go on to get a, an advanced degree and then to go on to grad school. And still to this day, my parents say, when are you going to go get a real job? <laughs> I'm still in school. So of course they joke now, but uh, are, you, are you joking? Are you no, no. Um, So, but to your question, uh, they, they appreciate the, 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 the education, but they weren't educated themselves. I think it's kind of the, well, I, I don't want to oversimplify, but um, I think it's kind of common, you know, I think uh, part of the experience. In any case, yeah. Are your parents like that too? Or are they educated and, uh, and had degrees and things like that? I'm curious. Mine are probably more educated than I'll ever be. They have PhDs. Ah, very good. My grandparents were like your parents, I guess. Gotcha, yeah. So how was the atmosphere at MIT like? Were there a lot of Asian Americans or did you find yourself? It's a very different world, again. Uh, so that's when I went to MIT. I went to MIT for grad school and uh, way across country. And, uh, and again, sharp people, right? Really smart. But at that time, everyone's geeky around you. Okay? Uh, but what was the culture like? It was, um, there were not that many Asians. It was, it was very, at least in chemical engineering, mm -hmm. there were not as many Asians as I thought there'd be. So as I went from... Sacramento to Caltech, I would say there are less Asians around me. Okay, and then going from Caltech to MIT, there were even less. I noticed that, but I never thought why. I just accepted it for what it was. Um, at least in my field, anyway. So, but other than that, it was it was a fine school. I learned a lot, and so that that was certainly from my experience there that made me decide. Yeah, I, I definitely want to be a professor. I didn't know I wanted to be a professor going in. I was just trying to not go get a job. <laughs> uh, but, uh, that was, uh, but that was an important part of my life to spend those number of years away from everyone to, to really strike out on my own as an independent person. Because once you're in grad school, at least on the STEM side, uh, they pay you to get a degree. You know, I don't, my parents didn't have to pay anything. I didn't have to pay anything. I get a little stipend per month. And uh, so it's my advisor who paid for my tuition and, and stipend and so I was off my own I was my true independent self and, and, and that was a that was a formative set of years there mm -hmm. so, yeah. so how did you decide to become a professor and like stay in academia yeah I didn't want to get a job, you didn't want to get a job? <laughs> I had the opportunity uh, to uh, and MIT was great uh, in that program where they had PhD students um, have the opportunity to get a master's degree. The master's degree is called a master's uh, in chemical engineering practice. Okay. And uh, it's, it's a very uh, well-known degree, uh, especially in the chemical industries. And for PhDs, I got my BS at Caltech, then I went to MIT to get my PhD. Um, but they also offered this MCEP this professional master's uh, uh, chemical engineering practice degree. Um, half of the people do it, so I did it. Um, and that was when I took a semester off from research and then to take a bunch of courses and then during this one semester, essentially do an internship at two companies. Um, but at a high level, you had to present, analyze a problem, provide a solution, and I did it at two companies. And um, one was a drug company, one was a chemical company, uh, I mean, really hardcore chemical engineering. And after that, I said, thank you very much. I'm going to pick up my degree, picked it up. I said, I do not want to work for industry <laughs> or in industry. I wanted to be my own boss uh, in, the, in the way. And I wanted to work on problems that excited me. They were working on important problems, but I wanted for me to work on important problems, but also problems that got me really amped up. 
And so that was when I then asked my old prof my professor, former professor, so what's it like to be a professor? You know, of course, I can see her what she was doing, but uh, and that's when we started to talk a little bit more, and that's when she helped me to, to do the things that made it easier for me to apply for faculty positions. So, and also like to teach, too. That was a thing, too. You know, from my teaching, you know, from all my good teachers, uh, and I did tutoring in high school, and then college, I did a little bit of that. Um, and then in, in grad school, I you know, TA'd a class, uh, and um, I liked I like teaching. It's just it's it's uh, it's fun. I I get I get a kick out of it. I mean, uh, do you guys tutor or anything like that uh, in high school? In high school? Um, it's just you know for me, if I can explain something that's uh, in a way to someone. To, to, to a student, uh, and I say define students very broadly, and they get it. Oh man, that's it's amazing. It's just a little thing. They say ah, oh. and they're thinking, and then I'm, and then that, that that that's impactful. And so it's it's a little little bit of a kind of mini high, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I get that when I teach classes every year. Um, but so that was where I just said, you know, I like my research, but I also like teaching. And that's when my former advisor said, you know what, maybe you should think about being a professor. So, you guys thinking about professor down the road, way down the road? <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell I tell everyone, you know, just keep your options open. You know, uh, but also uh, my way is not the best way. It's one way, but it worked for me. Is this process of elimination? Um, you don't know what you don't know. Um, life experiences will open up your eyes in so many ways. Today, tomorrow, next year, you just cannot predict where you're going to be six months from now, 12 months from now. It's, it's crazy to think you can read the future and predict the future. So keep all options open, but if, if there are things you don't like, well, start to shave them off. You know? And uh, if you haven't shaved off the idea of going to uh, grad school or for, uh, for advanced degrees, then that's an option on the table. So, so maybe you might be professors down the road. <laughs> So did you face any challenges like us in Asian American in the engineering fields? Yes, yeah, 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 big time. Um, and that was probably in, in graduate school when I started to be aware, and I would say self-aware, because there are so few Asians. Uh, my old boss was uh, Asian, actually. She was uh, Chinese, not Chinese American. She was, she was, um, she was born in Asia, but then moved over, uh, and then grew up in, the, in, in America. So, uh, and actually, I don't know, I should ask her that. Um, but she was, a, she was a role model, I mean, to me. She was one of the few Asians uh, in the department as a professor. I was kind of a big, you know, you don't think about, I didn't think about these things. Um, and until I think back about it, I said, that's maybe one of the small reasons why I, I gravitated towards her. I didn't know how to articulate that. I didn't say, oh, she's Asian, therefore I'm going to go talk to her. It just sort of happened like that. Um, and so there's a lot of, so, and then she happens to be you know, one of the few females within my field. You know, there's not that many females in the engineering field. In chemical engineering, we do a little bit better than other engineering majors. Um, but that was something that, that wasn't a thing for me. I was just, I just got along with her a lot, uh, really well. Um, and so, but then going through it, when she said, oh, you know, you think about being a professor, I started to then start to pay attention. Well, how many professors here are Asian? One, two maybe, you know, and I don't see them, but at least you see the name on the website. That's when I started to think deeply about these things. And that I was, uh, my eyes opened up big time. And then, and then in thinking about that, then I think about my interactions with people now. You know, through the lens of being, while well, American, but being you know, Asian. And it explained it all, it explained a lot of things. Things that didn't make sense to me, you know, the year before. Oh. It, so it was, it was, uh, these are the little things. There wasn't any particular event or anything like that. Um, but definitely, I would say in grad school, that was, uh, that was when I became very aware of being Asian. And what it meant to be Asian, too. I didn't know how to differentiate Asian and Asian American. And then of that, there's all these categories. And, and um, so there's that little bit of maturation that I had to go through. Um, so, yeah, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's maybe that talks a little bit about my experience, I guess. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot to unpack, I would say. So, yeah. So, what's 
so what were some of the things that started to make sense when you thought about being Asian? Yeah. Um, I hadn't thought about that, uh, um, although I should have thought about it since we scheduled this thing. Um, I have to get back to that. I, I, I yeah, it's um, there were things, it, just a lot of little things, yeah. little micro interactions, you know, that uh, and and yeah, huh? These are fun questions, by the way. Really fun questions. Oh, oh I'll tell you one. I'll give you an example. Um, who do you, who do you hang out with after classes? Who do you hang out with? in your dorm, right, in your college, right? So it's a rhetorical question, but for me, uh, in grad school, um, college, something similar, but we'll talk about the grad school stages. I lived in a, in a, in a house with some other uh, chemical engineering graduate students, and we're all, I mean, very diverse, right? That wasn't a big deal at all. And so, right, so I it would hang out with them, right, uh, for certain things. If we had a house party, definitely, they're all good friends. And then I have another group of friends from my lab, you know, so we get together all the time. Um, and. Uh, and actually, a subset of us loves to play golf. That's when I learned how to play golf. And uh, and so we kind of hang out with certain people. Um, and then there are other lab mates where I don't hang out playing golf, but I hang out talking about research. So we have, so you have kind of different groups, right? And uh, and uh, I met my, my my wife there at some point, uh, maybe towards my fourth year there. And so uh, so that was that little group there. And so, but before that, um, so that was when I spent a lot of time with, uh, with uh, my wife, uh, at that time, girlfriend. Um, but before that, you know, what were my group of friends? And so, at Caltech, I had my kind of group of Asian friends. At MIT, did I have an Asian group of friends? I didn't. You know, I could have, and anyway, I've been to those parties, but, uh, but it was something that didn't occur to me as a thing. Um, but until I start to think and I suppose, suppose going through this maturation process. And so, um, again, there wasn't any particular incident that would say or, you know, these are more sort of micro interactions, things that uh, sort of came about that made me think and reflect a little bit. Who do I hang out with? And at MIT, I hung out with certain people, but not as a group. So there wasn't like an Asian group I hung out with. And so I thought, oh, that's curious. I had that at Caltech, but not here. So, you know, that's a, that was an example of my thinking about my own Asian experience, Asian Asian American experience, I guess. So, yeah. Um, okay. So then how did you come to rice from did you come straight from MIT? I did, I did. I I, I um, um just for the job. Uh, at that time, I it, it's a very interesting. It's a, at least to me is a. I just came here for the job. Right? I knew about rice. Rice is excellent, and and, and and chemical engineering, nanotechnology was becoming a thing of its own. Um, and I applied to different places, but my family's back in California, so mm -hmm. they they asked, ah, you know, I should think about coming to California. I just want a job. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter where. And I wasn't married at that time, and so I could have stayed on the East Coast. It's just getting a job. I was, at that, by that point, I'd done enough traveling. I felt um, I became a little bit more worldly, I would say. Um, um, but I was, I was very open, you know, to, to working in any part of the country. And so, Texas. You know, I had a good friend from college who was from Texas and uh, came from Houston, actually. And so... And I remembered, oh, yeah, um, you know, he told me about rice, and, and that name, it, you know, kept on uh, sticking in my head, and one of my lab mates, uh, classmates at MIT came from rice. So I applied to rice, and, and yes, there was internet by that time, and so I looked at it, oh, that looks pretty good. Uh, came here for the job, I mean, very simply, interviewed for the job, and, uh, and they gave me the position. Um, and, uh, and at that time, I said I will come but I want to take a year off before starting so give me a year kind of delay so I can go back to California do some postdoctoral training and then before starting my job in 2001 mm -hmm. so yeah um, do you feel like you've had to like I don't know I mean this might not be a question you know an answer to mm -hmm. um, but like do you feel like you had to work harder as an Asian American in engineering to like either be recognized or to get opportunities or do you think it's pretty like, I don't know, a 
subjective. Yeah, it's um, that was probably where in in starting my job here again, just kind of following sort of my experiences from MIT. Uh, even it probably started there already, um, which is I'm already a little different. Okay, um, I don't speak with an accent, but I look Asian. Okay. Um, and so you got to deal with those stereotypes, and so you got to deal with people's expectations. Um, so n it's one of those things you learn over the years, where you kind of have a sense of have these folks interacted with Asians before, okay? And sometimes they have, sometimes they don't. You can tell probably in the first five seconds. Right? Um, and it took me, you know, some years to kind of develop that awareness of it, and it's all good, you know. I don't take it, you know, either good or bad. I just they just don't have that experience. And so some people are just very uncomfortable. Just uncomfortable. Have you seen that before? They just, they're just uncomfortable. I mean, not, not to say that they're oh, like, you know, they just, they just don't know how to say hi. You know, it's just kind of weird, right? And then others are just, hey, you know, just, there's a real difference there. And so it, it's not a, I would say, something that occurs all the time, but it's certainly I am prepared for it. And so whether at my job here, as department chair meeting people, me just being out there. Houston's great, actually. Um, but when I first moved down to, to, to Houston, I mean, it was such a different world for me also, and in all the different good ways and, and bad ways, too. Um, and so that's when I started to formulate my own, figure out what I am and what is my identity. You know, I'm Asian-American. I'm Chinese-American. Um, and so I feel like I have to represent properly for, for us, you might say. Um, and so, what was your question, <laughs> Patricia? Um, oh, <laughs> Priscilla, like, sorry. Um, have you, ex have, do you feel like you guys have worked harder? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, to, to, so it kind of goes together towards that. I have to feel, I, I feel like I have to represent now, where I am now. I, have to, I feel I have a responsibility to not just myself, my family, and the rights, but you know, for, I guess, my community, I guess, you know. I, I take ownership and, 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 and being part of this more communal uh, um, uh, part of, of, of this uh, of the group, I would say. Um, not that I go out and sort of evangelize and talk about things, but um, I'm aware of it. And so do I have to work harder? Yes, I do. Um, especially when I was starting off as an assistant professor. Even as a graduate student, I felt like I had to work a little harder. I didn't know why I had to feel like I had to work harder. It was one of those things where I had to learn, you know. Well, I'm, you know I, my, my work is pretty good, just like that other person. And yeah, that person, you know, got this award or something like that, you know. Why is that, you know? And uh, it wasn't anything, you know, well, I, you know, I, it wasn't anything, oh, well, it's because you're Asian, you didn't get it. It was just more like people get, are attuned to certain ways of doing things. And so, well, I didn't like that. Well, my work is just as good, if not better. Uh, so that upset me. Mm -hmm. So, but how, for me, how do you cope for, uh, with a situation like that? You do with the things and deal with the things that are in your control, which is to work harder. Okay? So absolutely, you know, uh, I did work harder. Um, how much harder did I work? I don't know. Um, but did I feel like I have to work harder? Yeah, I did. Um, was it because I, I was a, I was a Asian American or, 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 or Asian or... I don't know. At that time, I didn't. I couldn't figure it out. But I just felt like I had to work harder. I felt like I had to pop out a different in a different way. And so, I was very well aware of that. Now, thinking now, asking me that question, is it because I'm Asian? Maybe. I, I don't know. Uh, if it's hundred percent or fifty percent or twenty five percent, I'm an engineer, you know. So I break it down by numbers. But I think there's a there's an important component there. So, yeah. So people talk about like the bamboo ceiling. Um, so did you feel a difference between like more entry-level jobs and then higher-level jobs? Yeah, uh, the bamboo ceiling, that's, uh, that's an interesting one, right? So you have the glass ceiling, yeah. right, and then the bamboo ceiling. Um, I think it goes together. Uh, I think it's, uh, is, uh, is there one for me you're asking? I, I don't know. It's kind of weird for me to think about that way because if there is a ceiling, I haven't hit that yet. Um, do I have to work harder? Do I have to work harder on the things that I do now? Absolutely. Now, do I have to work harder than other people because I'm Asian? I don't think about it that way. I just, I just have to work harder because everyone just is really awesome, you know. 
Um, is there, a, but the but the question might be a phrase, you know, is there a glass, a bamboo ceiling in the work that I do, which is as a professor? I'd say it depends on how high you want to go up as a professor. And so if you want to be a professor, well, I'm a professor. Uh, I guess I broke through the, the bamboo ceiling. I'm very happy. Okay? Uh, but if there's another professor who says, you know, I want to be a, um, you know, a university president uh, at some other some school at some point in the future, uh, and you can't, and, and that person can't get there, well, then maybe there, then you hit that ceiling. Um, so I'm just a professor here. Uh, I'm a department chair, so which is I still do what I do, but I kind of manage the, the the faculty, staff, and the students, and uh, 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 for the whole. And so for the for the Department of Chemical Engineering and my boss is the Dean of, uh, of Engineering. Um, so at least at Rice, I, I don't think, I don't feel that there's a bamboo ceiling, so to speak. Um, and I can't say that about what might be out there in the, in the, the real world, right? <laughs> we are very lucky at Rice because we, you know, we are the real world, but we are very, we're very, we do things the right way, I would say. <laughs> um, sure. okay. I mean, this um, this just ties back into like current news, or like I guess a couple of weeks ago, yeah. like, sort of ongoing. Is like, um, what's your opinion on like, um, conflict over affirmative action? Um, since you deal with students as well as like on an administration side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how do you guys feel about that? The Harvard thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I don't know. What does the what does the Asian community of students feel about the whole Harvard thing that the lawsuit that's going on now? I'm curious first. So personally, like, I feel like it hasn't hurt me yeah. because I made it here, and that's like good enough. Um, so I like I support it. I want more minority students to have like a better chance of getting into Harvard. Yeah. But my mom is very angry about it. <laughs> angry about it. Yeah. That's. And she would like it to not be that way? Yeah. Mm. How about you, Priscilla? I don't know. I guess like, I'm also like biased and like I've made it this far. Yeah. So like, I don't really have, I guess, if I were on the other end of like not being able to get to a school maybe because yeah. of I don't know. I can see both ways. Um, and I haven't really formed an opinion just because I've like, I guess, like gotten to where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. But like just from your experience, like talking to students, or maybe they haven't talked about it. No, we haven't talked about it. In fact, that's one of those things that um, that I don't do as much as I, I'd like to. You know, it's not that we bring it up in, in class about other things. Um, but that's that's an interesting topic uh, because it did. Um, I mean, it ties it ties into my experience uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, it's good that you guys have a, a you know. A, a, Thank you for sharing. Actually, um, I like it that when people know both sides of the of the sort of issue and and, uh, and and to be informed about it, whether or not you have an opinion or made a decision or sort of a, a strong opinion one way or the other, the fact that you're informed I think is the first step. A lot of people just eh, you know. Um, for me, my opinion come is is, um, is flavored by the fact that I am. Sort of, I'm a professor. I teach. You know, uh, I'm sort of part of the administration, so I, I get where they're coming from. Um, but I also speak from someone who tried to apply to Harvard. I didn't get in. Okay. Um, so how did I feel about that? How do I feel about it now? Um, so it's hard. It's such a hard thing. On one hand, you want to provide opportunities to everyone. That uh, that deserves it. Okay, it deserves it. Sort of a you know that's a very fluffy word, right? Then there's another objective where you want to have a student body that represents a, sort of a, a, a and provides the full life experience to to the university that is reflective of the diverse nature of the of the, of the, of the country. So that's another objective. Uh, and then there's the university objective, which is you know. Uh, there's a, based on history, you know, uh, good and bad, that uh, they they, they, they want to make their alums happy. Okay? So there's there's multiple objectives there, um, and so and that's why I don't say there's one way that works well at all schools. Okay, but I think you have to be fair. 
Um, but at the end, by favoring one group means you automatically disfavor another one because the, the, the pie is only so big. There's only so many number of slots. It's a hard question. It's a hard problem to solve. Um, I don't have an answer to it, but I'll I'll take the logical sort of a step by step uh, in one way, which is if you go completely based on GPA, right, and SAT scores and and, and, and academic metrics, <laughs> I I think I'd be pretty confident to say the the, the uh, at a school we'll just say school X, right, uh, that Asian would flood, right, that 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 uh, the population there, not hundred percent, but I mean forty percent, fifty percent. I mean, why? Because that's part of our culture. Education is built in, um, and also life circumstances too. We can afford it, and we're we're, we're willing to, you know, to to sacrifice for the for the sake of education. And and uh, and other families can't do that, or they may not they're unable to do that. And so there's already some self selection there. And so the 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 real question is, do you try to break through that? Do you try to help them out by providing that additional help? Because if you just go straight off numbers, then, then it just favors those who are already doing well. And I think that's one of the issues that, that at Harvard, representing universities, are going through right now. How much role does a university have to help the full population? Okay, so if Harvard just says, I want to just bring in the best people, well then you're the best people are going to come from the top richest folks. So you just self, sort of self-propagate there. And so what about the folks that are in the, you know, 99% down here or 50%? So there's that level of, of uh, societal responsibility that each university will have to have. Um, and so Rice has done a good job when they said, oh, you know, we're going to support all students whose family income is less than 100000 or something like that. I mean, that's amazing. Um, and um, now, should all schools do that? I don't know. You know, Johns Hopkins, they got this huge uh, contribution from uh, from uh, Mayor Bloomberg, right, who came to give the commencement uh, speech uh, last spring, and he's given the university, uh, that university, like one point something billion dollars or something like that to, to give free tuition. I mean, my goodness, that's amazing. But that's at one school, too. So common to all universities I think are the are those those different boundaries are those different um, objectives there how do you achieve all those objectives well you can't how do you balance it between I think that's what each school is going to have to struggle through okay um, so to the point about the Harvard uh, those are those are my opinions by the way I, so I don't have a solution to it um, I think having affirmative action is important because I think we as a you know, as, as, as a country and nation need to support those who are less well off, who are unable to break through their wall, their ceilings, okay? Just like we have a bamboo ceiling, there's other populations and other groups that have their own ceilings. And so, you know, those folks at the bottom, you know, they can't help them. They can't, you know? And so to say that, oh, they don't deserve because they're not working hard enough, that's, that's not right. And so for me, that, that's a little bit of a life philosophy too. And so... Um, what should Harvard do? I don't know. Okay. Um, but those are some of my thoughts there. Um, so what is exciting about your career today? And do you have any foreseeable challenges in the research or like work that you do? Yeah. Um, I love my work. Uh, I love teaching. I love doing research. I love making this department better. I love making the university better. Um, you no, know, research is research. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like a day to day thing. And so I, I wouldn't say there's a particular challenge, more that sort of detailed challenge. You know, golly, why doesn't this experiment work today? Mm -hmm. well, why can't we get this one grant funded? And so those are, I would say, um, normal uh, struggles that uh, we as professors go through. Maybe a, a, a broader question is, you know, um, you know, what are the bigger challenges going forward for maybe. Um, is it for me or for the department, uh, Priscilla? What do you um, what what what, I, what kind of answer do you want? Oh, for you. For me, <laughs> golly, uh, just to do good, I guess. You know, um, you know. But I would say one thing I'd like to do more of, which is, is to learn more about, you know, the Asian American experience from the student level. You know, 
thinking back about it now, now that I'm sort of where I am, I, I have time to reflect a little bit more. And I do teach students in my class, and uh, and uh, but I think more things at a, at a bigger level, you know. Um, how do the students deal with this uh, sort of issue about uh, um, you know, about identity? Okay, uh, how do you work through it now? And again, thinking back about my time at Caltech, I, I kind of struggled it through myself. I had a little, you know, group of you know, Asian kids who just hung out, and uh, and uh, and that was helpful for me. Um, and so, but that was not too long ago, but yeah, it's kind of long ago now. Um, so I'm curious to know, going forward, you know, what are the challenges for you guys, you know? And do you guys think about this deeply? I know you're doing this as part of the, uh, how do you call it, H-A-A-A? Or do you have a separate ha. name for it? Ha? Yeah, ha? 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 <laughs> uh, I think it's great which is what you're doing. I think what Anne's doing, I think is great for the, for the, for the community also. And so if anything, I'm much more aware of the, of that there is a thing, okay? Do you, have you guys seen that, you know, Crazy Rich Asians? Mm -hmm. uh, what did you guys think of that movie? Well, I don't love rom-coms in general, but I was purely just happy to see Asians yeah. in the movie. Uh, same, same for you <laughs> or yeah, different? I think, yeah, I like seeing representation, but at the same time, like, it could go bad, and, like, people just think of Asians as, like, being rich and stuff, so yeah. like, there's also, like, pros and cons. Yeah. Um, for me, I watched it. I loved it. I was surprised I loved it. Um, <laughs> but for me, yeah, it just yeah, there's a whole thing too about Asian representation in the movies, right? I mean, that that's a thing in and of itself. Um, but for me, I, I was I felt proud, and uh, the story was good. I liked it, uh, and uh, I think it was so so crazy rich that I think it's a it's a caricature. I don't think people will say that all mm -hmm. Asians are like it like that. Uh, I happen to love the country Singapore, so it, it makes me laugh, you know, uh, seeing some of the things they talk about. Um, but the fact for me, what, what really made it for me was that it differentiated the experiences of the Chinese with the Chinese Americans or Asians and Asian Americans. That was one of the struggles that I have with not just faculty, but just I would say just uh, people in, in academics, I would say. And I think that's, that's a fair thing to say. There's a lot of Asian professors. Okay. In the STEM side, especially, but we're we're not all the same. Okay, there's Asians and there's Asian Americans. Uh, a lot of Chinese, not that many Chinese Americans. Okay, some Koreans, fewer Korean Americans. You kind of go down the line like that. Okay, uh, not very many Vietnamese, very few Vietnamese Americans. So, for those who don't think about it, who has not had that experience. Uh, uh, at other schools here we do a much better job but there's some other schools that are very very different and that's all the same it's just Asians so I think that's one of the struggles and, and one of the things uh, I want to do see what I can do to kind of help bring better awareness to it and I think having a movie like that that came out that differentiates the, just the compare and contrast and they did it in a very nice and gentle way um, I think that, that spoke volumes for me, and I think that same message, I think, is very applicable um, and uh, to to those who are in my area of work, the academic world. So, so how do you balance work and family life? Not easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, my my two little girls are ten years old and six years old, and I have a loving wife, but we juggle, 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 um, and you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not a woman, uh, and I try to do my best to understand the challenges of being a woman and a mother. Um, but there's just certain things that are very women-specific, you know, um, that, that they just have to spend, they just have to do all the things that, uh, that, that, that men just can't do. Um, and uh, so, so my job as a, as a sort of department chair, uh, and to be aware as a faculty is to be even more supportive of uh, female faculty who are mothers. Okay, because they're not only worrying about their teaching and their research, but they have a family at home too, um, and so and that's a unique experience that I think that uh, um, whether you're Asian or not, that, that's something that um, um, I try to do as department chair to make better. Now, how do I balance it for myself? It's not easy. Uh, we have nanny help uh, for sure, and but our kids are of that age where they're going to all sorts of dance things like that. And, and so scheduling is very important, and our family don't do not live in, in Houston, 
we live outside. And so um, how the answer is um, toughly, <laughs> but it's a day-to-day by day-to-day basis. Every semester is different. Every week is different. And, and you just manage. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So you said you met your wife at MIT? Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. And how, are, or how have, you, have you been involved in the Asian American community? I know you said you want to be more involved. Yeah, I, I haven't. Um, so when I moved down to Houston, um, my... I moved down to Houston after I had come down to Houston only twice before, once before, for my interview. Okay. Uh, and um, had a nice interview and, 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 and really loved what I saw and, uh, and the department loved what they saw and then, and then we shook hands and then got the job. And when I moved down to Houston, okay, um, I, did, I did not realize how many Asians there were. That's how, how not aware I was of these things. I was just literally came down here for the job. Um, I knew there were Asians of one of the professors in this department, George Hirosaki, he's Asian, and so, uh, and um, that was nice, but you know, they, there was a huge, China, there's two Chinatowns, right? And of course, one's more kind of, uh, the old one in the, in the, in the in Edo, right? The sort of east of downtown, and then there's the Bel Air site. And at that time, um, they didn't take me there. They didn't talk about it, and I was fine. Um, so it was a surprise for me when I moved down here, and then George says, oh, let's go to Chinatown for dinner. Huh, what? <laughs> <laughs> I heard about it, but uh, but then he, uh, his wife, and uh, at that time, I was single, and Susan was at, at, uh, at medical school, so we went to dinner at night, and so all the lights, I mean, it. Oh, my mind was blown. <laughs> it reminded me of San Francisco, uh, and that, that, was close, that was close to Sacramento. I said, oh, I, I was flabbergasted, honestly. I, I honestly did not, I just assumed it was just all cowboys and cowboy boots. I mean, that was how little I knew about Texas and Houston. Uh, and so I was continued to be surprised about Houston and, and the Asian community. There's a lot of Asian communities here, and so uh, I, because of the juggling of family and work, I just don't have um, that sort of, not so much time. I, I, the interest is there, uh, not to make an excuse of it. I want to know more about it. Um, having said that, uh, we were connected, we were, we, not, not less so now because of all the scheduling stuff with the uh, Taiwanese community. Uh, my wife is from Taiwan, um, and so we hooked up with the Taiwanese community, uh, taking uh, with us you know, Sunday, not, uh, Saturday language classes and things like that, and helping with their with their um, uh, events and things like that. Volunteering, especially with my wife, uh, I helped by by paying tuition for my Chinese class. Mm-hmm. I learned to I learned finally my Chinese writing uh, through through uh, through the uh, Saturday classes that I took with my two daughters. Yeah, they were they were in level three and four, and uh, I was in level. They didn't call it zero, <laughs> but it could have been zero. Uh, I knew some Japanese before, but uh, but to speak it uh, in, in Mandarin, uh, I wanted to learn Mandarin, um, and uh, and that was not easy for me. Um, but I did it. That was cool. Um, I did it for a couple of years, and so that was my way of kind of giving back. And that was my learned. That was a really that just. There's a lot of Asians who are outside of academics. So my world is academics. That's my world, um, and uh, in the chemical industry. But yeah, it was it was nice to see. So, but to the point, yeah, I haven't connected too much with the Asian community. So when I had lunch with uh, with Anne a while back, she was telling me all about this. I mean, she was telling me these stories about the folks that were interviewed and uh, through through Ha, and I was like, man, that's some amazing stuff. And so. Um, so I think that the food culture here, I think that that's such an important part of the Houston history, but it ties in so much with the, with the Asian American history, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. Do you now go to Chinatown to like grocery shop or eat often? Oh, after that, <laughs> after that <laughs> dinner? Every week. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really blown up. I mean, I would say in the last, um, are you guys from Houston or from uh, outside? I'm from Houston. Okay. Mm-hmm. Where are you from? South Carolina. South Carolina, excellent. Uh, and uh, it was just, um, it just exploded. And, 
and uh, it's Asia Town, right? It's not we call it Chinatown, yeah. but it's Asia Town. Um, but it's been really nice to see. Um, and so, um, no, we go there every other week. I would say we don't go to Chinese class anymore, and so we don't go there as often. Um, and so, I wish they have a little little. I wish the metro there's a metro stop. <laughs> Do you go there every? Uh, yes. Good. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> What makes you most proud of being an Asian American? What makes you so proud? Wow. Um, I think just representing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, I think the other things, not, not to say I, I, that, uh, you know, yeah, what, what, what are we trying to say? Um, I guess me doing what I'm doing and me being the face of this department for my group for the university, uh, representing the, the department, um, the I think that makes me that makes me feel good about what I do for my job. But the fact that I'm Asian American, I think, makes me feel extra special. There's why because there, there are not that many of us that are kind of in the same role. You'll see them around, and so, but they not to say that's a numbering counting thing, and I'm not counting how who's doing what, but it's just uh, representing, you know, what what we are as a as a as a, as a city, and um, there are a number of Asian Americans uh, in as the professor level, uh, but also in the administration level. So it's been nice to see. Um, so I feel like I'm doing my part to, of course, not only doing what I'm doing as a chemical engineering professor. Uh, but also as an Asian American. So I feel like it's almost like a, a responsibility now. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that comes, maybe, uh, I guess I'm self reflecting a little bit here, which is now, now that where, I, where I'm at, now that I'm seeing my kids grow up and seeing how they're responding and absorbing things, and, uh, and I feel a true responsibility to represent the Asian American community. Mm-hmm. And so, whatever I do, it's uh, through that lens now. And so when did I become aware of this? I don't know. It's a sort of evolved process. So, um, but that's how I feel now. So, other things on your mind? <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I'm going to ask, uh, what are some of your proudest accomplishments so far? Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, that, that's just a bunch of work stuff. I, I I would say uh, I'm still active in doing what I'm doing, and so um, you know all the kind of all those things right there. Oh, this is my office, by the way. So my corner office, but uh, these are all those things on the walls. These are my awards. Uh, very cool and very awesome. And then uh, my most recent ones were with this guy here. This one came out this year. Uh, the American Chemo- I'm a chemical engineer, but I do chemistry also, and so um, uh, they selected me as a fellow of this uh, of this professional society. Um, and uh, there was one that is, um, is, uh, is an important tie for me. So this one I received this year. It's named after, it's also part of the Chemical Society. But this was from the um, Greater Houston section. It's a named award. And see the name right there? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the name of the professor who helped hire me here. Uh, so Joe passed away several years ago now. He's an important name and figure in not only at the university, but in the Houston community. Uh, and so so for me, this was one of the things, uh, I guess one of the highlights for this year, which is to, to receive an award named after the professor who not only hired me, but also took me under his wings because he was doing the same research that, I, that I'm still doing. So it's, he's kind of like a mentor, you yeah, know? To awesome. get an award named after your old mentor, it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so... That, that was that, 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 that uh, I would say something I, I would highlight for this year. Um, okay. But we're still doing great work, and uh, I think you know, and, and graduating students and creating new ideas on how to clean water. I'm a big big fan of clean water. I mean, who doesn't like clean water? Uh, but we use chemical engineering technology and using nanotechnology to do that in a cheaper way and whatnot. Uh, so so you know that that's that work will still continue. I would say. But yeah. Okay. Um, so, did you have any questions? No. You
you've asked everything you wanted to ask, uh -huh. if you had to ask any question, and this is probably the, uh, the, the, the most candid I am, because how often do you get a chance to, to talk to a professor and ask these detailed questions, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe over college dinner or something like that, uh, uh, but hard in class or at a coffee shop. I love my coffee. Okay, okay. Um, so how do you balance your children's Asian and American identities? Oh. I mean, do you talk about it? That's a good question. We talk about it. We talk about it. Um, they're learning for themselves um, about, they're American, number one. Um, they're born here. Uh, but number two, of course, they're Asian. Why? Because uh, they know that because we go to Chinatown, we talk about it, we hang out with grandparents, we go to Taiwan every couple of years, every other year, uh, or even every year, and uh, or we go see my side of the family. And so they're surrounded by, by, by Chinese culture all the time. And so, and we took them to Chinese class uh, for, for many semesters. And so they are aware of their heritage um, and they are aware of that they are American. They are both. They recognize us. Um, but they haven't gone through the struggles yet, uh, but they certainly notice that, oh, in their class, there are a few, you know, but there's not, it's not, uh, at least they're not the only ones, uh, but it's not as if half the class are Asian. And so they, not that they ask those questions, but some of the interactions, uh, no, you know, they haven't, it hasn't come up, I would say. Um, but the questions do come up, for instance, for example, uh, why do I have to learn Mandarin? I know. <laughs> <laughs> do you speak school. Chinese? Do you speak Mandarin well? No, no I zero? understand it. You understand it? My parents speak Cantonese. Oh, they speak no. Cantonese. Oh, excellent. Do you speak Cantonese? Oh, not that great. Not that great. Do you understand it? <laughs> yeah, I understand it. Um, and so that's, um, so th there's that, that level of discussion we do have at home. Um, and is, is it a struggle? It's not a struggle. Uh, it's more of a, it's an ongoing sort of discussion uh, and, and things that you know, ultimately they're going to do what they want to do, but they got to do it with a passion. And so right now, they, their Spanish is better than their Chinese, put it this way. Um, but at least they're aware of it. They know it's there for them, that when they're ready to dig into it, that they, that they can and that they should. Uh, I think people should be acculturated to many languages and to other um, countries and, and to be to be more you know worldly I think I think that's an important part of, 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 um, of just being more well-rounded and so part of that is learning languages and for for them uh, they, they know they're Asian they know they're Asian American but for them oh, they're just Americans it's interesting so that's going to be my struggle as a parent now to to teach them what I know but also to see them involve and to kind of help them along the way so um, but yes, we have the discussions, not in those terms, but you should take Chinese. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. okay. um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, to I could go on and on, yeah. as you can probably <laughs> tell. Uh, no, but <laughs> um, the things that I've said, is that something, is, are those the things that uh, are going to be helpful for Ha? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that one thing for me is at least the Asian American experience within in Houston, in Texas. I learned a lot from him, okay. and she as he compiles these stories and to 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 to, to continue to support this. Um, and she gave this talk about it a couple of years ago. That's when I first met her. Actually, uh, she gave this really inspiring talk, and um, and that's why I I'm, was. I'm not retired yet, you know, um, and um, I'll let that go away. Yeah, we're good. Um, what was I going to say? Well, I'm going to let that go away first. Um, there's still a lot of things I want to do uh, as an Asian American professor. Um, and so it's, I would say the things I want to do, we're still, I'm still a work in progress. There's a lot of things that I think are going to be great, and so, but I'm very mindful of me being an, an Asian American now, um, you know, that the things that I can do to help the Asian American experience is not the right word, but just uh, 
just to put the good word out, you know, and just to be more to to represent uh, more actively. I think I think that's something that that's uh, that's become, especially with my daughters now, they're becoming a little bit uh, older and, and growing up. That uh, that responsibility, it, it's it's uh, I feel it now. Uh, if you asked me five years ago, I mean, I'd be saying, hey, I'm just I'm just doing my thing, you know, nothing much to say, you know. But but I, it's much bigger than me. This Asian American experience, I think, is a is, is a, it's a rich one, and it's, it's a, from what the things that I've learned from Hoth, uh, I have, uh, there's little stories that I've read a little bit, and the people and I read the bios. There's some amazing people, amazing people in, in, in Houston, and so, um, and you know, George, my my colleague in this department, I mean, he has an amazing story. You know, compared to him, I'm boring. <laughs> you know, and he so so he's uh, he, he's an inspiration for me. I mean, but all those before me, I would say, I mean, uh, to say they inspire me sounds kind of kind of like you know cheesy, but they, they, it's true. They the things that they do, the little things that they do, I think, uh, big and small, I think it really adds to 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 the culture of Houston. And so, um, you know, I think as a representative of Rice. As an Asian American, as the university kind of reaches out and works more with the uh, the Houston uh, community, I mean, I think we've done a really good job. You've been here what three years now? Three, both of you, three years or so. That uh, with the with President LeBron when he first came on board over ten years ago, one of the things he really focused on was to go you know outside the edges, right? Um, and um, and everything is just really exciting. And if you add that Asian flavor to it, not just Asian, but Asian American, I, I think we can bridge the gap, you know, because there is a gap, right, of understanding and, and familiarity with uh, with what it means to be Asian with uh, with non Asians, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's that's I feel that responsibility, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to get a grade on it, <laughs> yeah. um, so I'll do my little things, big and small, and hopefully what I'm doing here today uh, contribute towards that in my little small little way. So. How's that sound? Sounds really good. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Good, you're welcome.